Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our Artists in Conversation series. I'm Tracy Adler, Johnson Co. Director of the Wellen Museum and Curator of Rona Bittner Resound. This exhibition marks Rona Bittner's first solo museum retrospective and features seven bodies of work created over the last 30 years. Uh, from those of you who have seen the show know much of Rono's practice is dedicated to the spaces and performers and um, trappings of performance and reflects our, uh, our interest in spectacle as the audience as well. I am thrilled that we are hosting our conversation in Well and Works here for the first time. Um, well and Works is an interactive space that is designed around themes in the exhibition and developed by Marjorie Hurley, our museum educator, in conjunction with Rona um, and uh, Hamilton students as well. Um, it's been a busy week for Rona, who's meeting with 11 classes from six different disciplines, and I know that we're all thrilled to have her in conversation with um, Assistant Professor of Art History, Nadia Baer, who is taking a break from her sabbatical to join us. So a special thanks to her. Um, I'm going to read both of their bios, so bear with me. Uh, Nadia Baer is a historian of photography, the press, and mass visual culture. She has published widely on the history of photojournalism in the journals American Art and History of Photography, and several edited volumes, including Life Magazine and The Power of Photography, which won the Alfred Barr Award in 2020. Bear's first monograph, The Decisive Network, Magnum Photos, and the Postwar Image Market, won the 2021 Prose Award for Media and Cultural Studies. Her second book project, focused on New York's International Center of Photography and its founder, Cornell Kappa, is awarded, was awarded a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship for 2023-24. Rona Bittner lives and works in New York City and Paris. She has participated in exhibitions in Paris, Venice, Vienna, among other institutions throughout the US and abroad. Her book, Listen, was published in 2022 by Rizzoli in English and French editions. Bittner's work is in the collection of the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Ringling Museum of Art, our own Wellen Museum, and the Maison Européenne de la Photographie and Fond National d'Art Contemporain. Bittner is the recipient of the Paula Krasner Foundation Grant and the New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship in Photography, and has been an artist in residence at U Cross Foundation and the Sharp Walenta Studio Program. She is currently a fellow at the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts, where you can find her. Thank you both so much for joining us today. We're thrilled. And I will leave it to you, Nadia, to start the conversation off. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Tracy, for the introduction. It's good to be back for an afternoon, and it's good to see um, so many students here. And so given the setting of our conversation on a college campus, I wanted to start this conversation by actually asking you to talk about your college experience, which was really formative and was a time when you came to photography. So I wanted to ask you to start by talking about your exposure to photography while you were at NYU, but also about the job you had while you were in college because I think both of those are really important to understanding where you kind of come from. Um, I, think, I think the two together were sort of two sides of a similar coin. Um, I worked through college at an advertising agency. I started in the mailroom. I started as an intern and then worked my way up. I didn't move into the creative department until much, much later. Um, and at the same time I was at NYU, I, I went to a liberal arts school because I wanted uh, to test and myself and see if maybe I, I always thought it was going to be a creative life, but I thought, well, let me try literature, let me try psychology and see, but it didn't take too long for me to just plant myself in the art department. And I was really lucky to have a professor who was, um, whose direction was conceptual and not technical. And my time there was very much, um, 
about the thought process behind making photographs. Whereas when I'd go to work, it was commercial photography. It was photography for utilitarian commercial, you know, uh, consumption purpose. But because I started on in a in the mailroom, I saw I worked through every department. I saw how things were produced and printed and uh, marketed. Uh, I saw people interact with clients, and uh, even I worked in in the accounting department and bookkeeping, so I learned how to do that. And all of, it was almost like a parallel education. So by the time I started making art on my own, I had a professional, a knowledge of professional comportment, as well as the conceptual idea-based practice that I learned in school. And what was the name of the advertising agency? Uh, it was, it, it, was, it changed names like three times. It yeah. was Reese Capiello Caldwell. And they developed this theory that has been since adopted by a lot of advertising agencies about positioning. Positioning. And you did. talked about that as kind of important for even how you think of yourself, right? And kind of your professionalism. In a way, it's, mm -hmm. it's, if you position a product within a, a receptive environment perhaps I mean I don't I don't know I'm talking out of the side of my head maybe it's you know uh, in film when there's what's it called when they plant a, a brand in a, in a mm -hmm. film mm -hmm. um, there's a name for it which product, product placement, placement. Yeah. there you go um, I don't know if that's a precursor but it's it was really about identifying your audience mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. And so when you were at NYU and you tried a number of different media, you tried painting, I think, right? Well, we were required. You required. But then you found your way to photography, right. and particularly color photography, right? Thanks to my professor, Jerry Pryor, who saw something in my work and really pushed me to be one of the first color photography students in the so what was the, And so what was that process? Because I think, you know, now photography is so digital and dematerialized. It's on our phone. We think color photo is the thing I take. Right. very quickly. So can you talk a little bit about what was the color photography that you were doing? Because this was analog photography, right? It this was, was a material process that involved film and chemicals and right. so. So um, I think people have seen somewhere in popular culture what it is to develop a black and white photograph. You put the piece that you expose the film through it in enlarger and then you put it in all these different baths of chemicals. Uh, Color photography, there were machines, I guess, that were doing it, but in school, and uh, it was similar baths in a, in a dark room, much darker dark room, than, there were no red lights, um, and you saw the image come up. So it was a hands-on, very smelly, a little bit carcinogenic experience, mm -hmm. but yeah. um, you actually used your hands to make your photograph, and it was a little bit like magic. You know, you put this piece of paper in a, in a bath and the image appears. So I think in a way it, it's, it, it's a precursor to some of the things that I say about my so, work now. So some of the, a lot of the work is in Cibachrome. Did you start working in Cibachrome when in you were in school? In school. So, so, so Cibachrome is a very stable color process that is yeah. also used a lot by commercial photography. So as you can see, I'm kind of pushing this sort of art commercial question, tension, you know, and I think one of the underlying questions is whether you see a conflict or what you think the relationship is between artistic work, the commercial sphere, and how you would approach that kind of much bigger question. But we can start with just the Cibachrome, okay. uh, but what is it about the Cibachrome process? <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leapfrog <laughs> okay. a little bit and say the commercial versus the conceptual or the artistic is intent. Everything is about intent, right? What are you, gonna, what are you making it for and why? Um, so then I'll go back to Cibachrome. Um, my professor saw something in my work and pushed me to color photography and Cibachrome, I don't, I really, I didn't look it up. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know when it was invented and introduced into the market, but there was a way to make Cibachromes by hand. Uh, Cibachrome is a very, very fragile, delicate uh, process that I think it was plus or minus a half a degree for the chemistry. And, but there was this like do it yourself at home kind of kit to make Cibachromes. And I, I'll never forget the gesture. 
instead of putting the photo, you could not see any light whatsoever. So you'd expose the paper and you'd put it in this black canister that had little legs. And you poured the chemistry in the canister and out of the canister as you changed however many three or different chemicals that there were in order to make the photograph. And in order to cover the paper evenly with the chemistry, you stood at a table and you went, like windshield wipers. Mm -hmm. And you had to do it methodically and systematically with time. I mean, it was so precise. And he, I was the guinea pig. I was the first student to try it out. And that was it. I was hooked. The, the palette was so black and so vibrant. Uh, the reds were beautiful. And it's been discontinued. There is no more cibachrome. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's very frustrating to me not to have that. And material. just as kind of historic, quick historical context, this was the late 70s. And it was up, early 80s. Early 80s. Very early, the beginning of the 80s. But for much of the 20th century, artistic photography was considered black and white. That was what was accepted as artistic photography. So you were really working at this very early moment when color photography was recognized by the art world as something that could also be artistic, kind of with a capital Absolutely. A. Absolutely. And it, I, the first art color photography show was William Eggleston in 76 mm -hmm. at the Museum of Modern Art. And it blew the lid off of the photography world. I mean, those photographs are extraordinary. And the, again, the color palette he was doing dye transfers uh, is just so beautiful. Um, and that opened an entirely new discussion of what is photography as an art form and opened the door to anyone making color photographs. He was the pioneer of it at that point. So since you mentioned kind of that 76 show at MoMA, I wanted to just ask you to reflect on this moment that you were coming up in, because what I find so interesting about Rona as kind of a cultural artifact, a specimen, <laughs> is... Dinosaur! <laughs> is um, Rona really kind of came of age as an artist in this really transformational moment in the art world when photography was being increasingly acknowledged as a fine art. So in the 70s and in the 80s, on the one hand, you had these discoveries of 19th century master photographers, and you had the Metropolitan Museum of Art for the first time showing what became known as vintage prints. Right. And so there was a way of kind of really looking back and thinking historically about the history of photography in the 70s. But there was also kind of new galleries that were showing contemporary artists and as photographers, as artists. So there was both kind of um, a commercialization, a popularity and interest in both the photography of the past and in contemporary photographers. And you took a really formative trip to Paris in 1980, I think. I think so. And so what was going on in Paris? What was going on in New York? Like what photographs were you exposed to? What, how, how did this world affect you? Well, this talk is the first time I've even thought about this in <laughs> 25, you know. Uh, so two things were going on. NYU situated downtown New York. Soho was my classroom. So I was, you know, I was young for William Eggleston's show at, at MoMA, but in the galleries while I was in school were Cindy Sherman's film stills and rear projections, and Martha Rossler's uh, kitchen semiotics, mm -hmm. and Louise Lawler, and Sherry Levine, and they were women. And they were the, it was the pictures generation, mm -hmm. uh, but they, they, anything was possible. I didn't, I didn't have to doubt myself, or there was, there was no sort of trying to check boxes. It, you can make anything. And you know, seeing Bruce Nauman in a gallery, and not in a museum was more human scale in a way, so I could absorb it. And all of this, and only now do I realize it became part of my DNA, that I thought I can do anything. It never occurred to me that I couldn't do it as a woman or as mm -hmm. a photographer. And, and uh, in 1980, uh, I don't even know why, in November, I found myself in Paris. I was in the middle of my studies at NYU, and it was the first manifestation of this, I don't know, maybe 20-year program called Mois de la Photo, the month of the photograph, where in November for the month, public spaces, galleries, museums, all showed photography as an art form. Mm -hmm. That blew my mind. 
right? And the first time in, in that November of 1980, not only was it the first time that I really understood, learned about Paris as the city and Versailles, which remember that, we're gonna mm -hmm. get back to that mm -hmm. in a minute, um, but it was also this discovery of this huge quantity of work for me to look at within, I took the little brochure that they made and I went, it, I remember it was numbered, number one to number like 80 something. I did every single show, I saw them all, I was systematically, and I learned the city by going from gallery to space, mm -hmm. but I just, I was obsessed with seeing it and I brought all that knowledge back. And then I have, on the other hand, Soho and everything that was going mm -hmm. on there. And Versailles is important because you started taking pictures, garden photos, and you found your way back to Paris every year, right? Every other year. Every, mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, my first serious body of work was understanding how uh, we situate ourselves in these sort of monumental landscapes. It was learning about scale. I think I was teaching myself because my professor was so conceptual, I had to learn the things that I could teach myself like perspective, uh, taking a camera apart, putting it back together, and all the technical stuff. Um, so I made a, a body of work. I mean, the, the, the rigorous approach that I use to my work now, I decided to photograph every garden that was made by André Lenotre, who was the gardener for Louis XVI. Um, and I brought that back. And in 1981, the Museum of Modern Art opened the very first show of Eugene Atche's photographs who is a photographer of old Paris, and he uh, systematically photographed uh, what would be then destroyed by Haussmann for the grand plan of Paris, the gardens, the streets, the chateau. Um, and so there I am with these two sides of the history of photography, the new and the old, and I just swallowed them. And, and a became, shout out to the Welland Collection. I think we have at least one Ajay that has been discovered, which might be put on view eventually, or you can ask to see it. So, um, this, so as, as we start to kind of move into the body of your work and kind of the subject matter of your work that we see here, um, you started talking about this kind of like really rigorous methodical approach and, and you've applied that for the last 30 years to performance. Um, so can you talk about the subject matter of your work um, beginning with kind of circus performers, moving into stages and performance spaces. What drew you to this subject matter? Um, and what did it take to make this happen? These are empty spaces behind which I think is a lot of uh, need to socialize and figure, you know, make connections. Like who are the people also that you worked with to make this happen? This is a very big yeah, question. Yeah, big question. Um, so I'll start with the first part of the question. I, again, because my the language that I had in my head was more idea-based, I kind of came up with this idea early on that's kind of simplistic. The camera and the theater are both black boxes. And the the aperture on each, the stage and the, the lens on a camera, both are sort of portholes uh, through which we see what's outside the black box. We may be in a different angle, maybe we reinterpret it, maybe we learn something. Um, it allows us to examine this outside, which is everyday life, right? Which is whatever all our experiences in a more intimate and considered way. The, either it's a theater piece or it's a photograph. Um, and so that was, that seemed like the parentheses between which I sh wanted to make my work. And it, it's a very rich parentheses, right? So I'll be doing this for the rest of my life. Um, and then I thought, okay, here I am with the rigorous methodical approach. I'll take this idea and I'll start to parse it out. I look, you know, I'll look at each angle in my own way. Uh, and by chance, I stumbled into Ringling Brothers Circus in New York just as a lark um, with a camera uh, in 1990 and made some photographs and 
I was really just kind of fooling around. But when I ran the film and I looked at the images, there was something there that drew me in and made me think twice about, well, maybe the place to start is the performer in the spotlight in this, within this idea of theater and camera parallel. Um, and I ended up spending 10 years following circuses around Europe at the end of the 20th century, um, specifically considering the performer in the spotlight and nothing else. And because it was analog photography and cibachrome, um, I uh, figured out how in the camera to expose the film purely uh, so that the performer would appear and nothing else. You don't see the ring. There's no, those photographs have no Photoshop work, no retouching. That's, the slide looks like that black with the performer right in the middle. To isolate them, to pull them out, to sort of present them, here, look at this, consider this. And the more I got into it, the more I understood how it really did illustrate what was going on in my head, the language of the circus parallels the language of the everyday. We jump through hoops, we walk tight ropes, we balance, right? Um, we juggle, and it more and more illustrated this concept. Um, and at the same time, I had in my head, um, literature is important to me, the very simple Beckett line, a voice comes to one in the dark, imagine. And it was all there. That's, that's where I'm going to park myself for the rest of my career. Um, oh, and then how do I do this? So and then, it's and all. Then, yeah, and from there you moved into stages, right? So, so from there yeah. I said, well, okay, what happens? You know, if I, if I finish working with the circus, where do I go next? Can I just interject with a question? Totally. How do you know when a series is done? My gut? Pretty much. Um, pretty much. I mean, later series like Listen is, has kind of a mm -hmm. beginning and an end, but I just, I've said what I need to say. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was at all these circus performances, I don't even know how many, I, I paid attention to that moment where the lights dim and the curtain begins to rise and we're all leaning forward in anticipation and expectation and that exists on both sides of the curtain. I mean, I, I, I'm not a performer, but this is a performance, and I was nervous before we started. So, you know, I, I imagine that it's the same for the performer. Um, and I wondered if it was a way to illustrate that ephemeral moment that we kind of want to hold on to, and we can't, because it goes by so quickly. Um, so I, I worked with traditional theaters, uh, with the light cues uh, that they use as the curtain rises. And just as with the circuses, I, have, I don't have the right to be in these spaces or these performances with my camera, just like that. I, have, I ask for permission. I'm, I'm going into somebody's house, right? So I had already spent years asking for permission from circus directors if I could attend their performances, and I just redirected that, uh, what, energy. that practice energy of asking for permissions to uh, traditional theaters, uh, which I then used for the rest of my work. So all of my work has this quotient of, please allow me access to your space. And you brought just your camera. You didn't bring lights. You didn't, did never you bring, bring assistance? Lights. Did no, you bring? I work what, alone. Like, like, Paint the scene for us. <laughs> uh, it's usually at night. Um, it's me and usually a tripod. With circus, no, I had cameras around my neck and I was running back and forth in the ring, uh, in the in the seats. But um, in the in the theater of work, it was me and a tripod and a camera, and you know, everybody was being generous towards me, so I needed to be generous in not wasting their time, and I, I worked as quickly as I could. Sometimes I had five minutes, sometimes I had 20. Um, rarely did I have an hour, and I set up my tripod and my camera, and I had to work fast and do it and get out. You, um, there's, we talked about methodical, rigorous, 
but I think researched is another word to describe your practice. So, um, and you, you said in conversations, you know, there's something about an archivist's work that's appealing to you, something about academic work that's appealing to you. And I think you are all of those things. So what is your research process like? Because you see the photos, but I don't think people see, they can't imagine how much research you do. So what is that process? I think it, it stems from curiosity. Right? I'm, I'm learning. I, I may be bringing something to show you and share with you, the audience, the viewership, but I'm also learning. Um, and each series is now getting more and more substantial. Mm -hmm. So circuses, it was just a matter of figuring out who was performing where, when. Uh, for the stage series, it was identifying the theaters and asking for permission and hoping that they gave me permission. Uh, when I finished the stage series and began the listen series, that became a, as much a research project as a photographic project and as much a photographic project as a conceptual walking project almost by going to these spaces. So, um, yeah. So what did you do? How did you how did you go about it? So the you listen, you. What did you get? <laughs> the listen project, um, for those who don't know, is a uh, well over 13 years of photographing, but about an 18 year project um, that uh, kind of maps and uh, visits uh, the inner architecture of American popular music from the clubs, churches, stadiums, fields and recording studios where music was heard or performed. Uh, it was my way of trying to photograph sound. It was the next step within this parsing out of the idea of performance to try and understand if I could photograph sound by photographing the memory of sound and eliciting in, in the viewer's memory uh, experience of music. Uh, in order to do that, not only did I need to ask for crazy amounts of permission from uh, state penitentiaries to Madison Square Garden to Soldier Field in Chicago, which is an, you know, a football arena, but to also to small clubs, um, churches, uh, recording studios that are private and closed off to the general public, many of them. Um, so identifying and asking for permission and the identification of which spaces came from musicians and performances and albums and famous concerts like Woodstock. Um, and the more I peeled that onion, the more interesting it was and the more I wanted to learn. And so the, the archive is file cabinets full of information. So when you were beginning or as you were working on this project, we talked about um, it's a two part question. So one is has to do with scale. You talked about how when you printed the images, you tried different sizes of prints to figure out what they should be. So I want to invite you to kind of talk about scale and how you choose the scale of individual prints and how you think about the scale of a series. But related to that is, you know, this um, this exhibition is such a is so large and yet <laughs> considering the scale of your series is just a very small piece of it so where should we be seeing the totality of your work how how do you envision somebody interacting with the totality of your work is it a mega exhibition is it a book what do you envision as the site for containing that series so scale is very important to me because something that I am determined to do in my work is to step aside and let the viewer enter the image and have the viewer have that experience and not sort of push my experience forward. It's not about me, it's about what we share, right? Uh, if, if I go back to my original idea of the black box and the lens being the aperture to human experience, I need to step aside and let humans into the work. Um, and each one brings their own personal experience and, and history uh, to the work. And maybe the work will mean something different to, to everyone, but at least it will mean something. Um, and in order to do that, I think it's not only 
the color palette, not only how I make the photograph and whether the photograph is good or not, but the scale changes your interaction with the work. The circus work, because I was, uh, there was a, a, a sort of treasuring of the circus performers, it needed to be more precious and it needed also because it was a sort of childlike theater to be a little bit, you know, like a child peering through a keyhole. Mm. And the photographs are small, they're eight by 10, and they're almost like little cabinets of curiosities of these performers flying through the air or juggling or. Uh, and then when I moved to the stage photographs, I wanted them to be, have more sort of gravitas, more presence. And they are so specific. They're 48 inches, they're not 46 inches, they're not 49 inches, they're 48 inches square, because that was the size that seemed to me as an average build person um, to work where I could welcome you in, but it still was a little grand. Um, when I got to the listen work, that needed to be more human scale, more sort of every man, much more humble, I think, and modest. And again, it was, and I ended up at 40 inches square. Um, and it's just, it's deliberate, and I know it when it's right. It just says, okay, this is where I belong. Um, and in terms of the project, I don't know, I, you know, nobody, I, what artist has a show with all of his work? Right, right. I would never pretend to expect yeah. that ever in my, you know, this has been such a mm -hmm. amazing experience <laughs> to see the work together for the very first time to scale, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's so emotional for me and so validating. Uh, and reassuring, um, but what you said about uh, objectifying and you know the, how different photography is now. This show, you know, my work, the photographs are an object. They're not a picture. They're not an image. They they exist physically, and yes, I think it's important based on how I make them and how hard I work to make them beautiful and perfect and um, everything I do and the, the scale and the way I, I even, the way I print the color photographs to pull out the silver and the chemistry of the paper um, so that they shimmer a little bit. Um, that's how I want them experienced. Mm -hmm. But who can have that? So a book is, is the trace. A book is where it can live, you know, um, and it won't be to scale and it's not the same process as no silver and printing, but it's something that many more people that could ever see the exhibition could hold in their hands um, and so they'd have a sense of the work. You know, somebody was uh, teasing me uh, when the Listen book came out, the Listen, the Listen project is over 400 photographs, and the Listen book that Rizzoli published so kindly and generously uh, is 299 of those photographs. And a friend said, you know, 30, 40 years from now, somebody's going to wander into an, a, you know, a junk shop, and there's going to be your book sitting there, and he's going to pick it up, and it's going to blow his mind. <laughs> and I thought, okay, that's it, right? So that person won't have been able to see work together but they'll have some idea well and with, with photography it's a paper-based medium and it's always been kind of this tension in the history of photography is do you see it in print in the book form in the magazine form or do you intend to put it on the wall and the print format has been historically much more of a democratic medium right. um, and it's far and fewer between of the pictures that could be put on the wall but it's kind of that tension I think continues to exist so you but now you're also fighting the phone yes I'm imagining that it doesn't exist for a moment. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so so when you talked about kind of you sequenced these pictures you chose how they would be hung on the wall what order, 
maybe the height. Sort of. Sort of, right? You, you talked about exhibition design as a form of typographic exercise almost. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about that, about kind of your approach to seriality and how you conceive of kind of the order of the presentation? regarding this how involved were you with that Rizzoli book I'm kind of interested did you very, did you choose very, you know oh, yeah. and, and what guides that sequence because I think as we try to you know as viewers figure out entry points into this I think individual images are so captivating and I've seen people stand in front of an individual image but I think the seriality is so important right and you and I've been talking about yeah. um and I'll quote an essay that Ronan and I've been talking about in 1968 um the artist Mel Bachner wrote in Art Forum, serial order is a method. It's not a style. Um, and the results of this method are surprising and diverse. And so he goes on to list a number of different artists. But the first one is Edward Moybridge's photographs, who made those serial photographs of the horses running Animal locomotion. right? Animal locomotion, phys uh, human locomotion. Um, so, so this like seriality, but to which I would also add like the sequencing, the series, the sequence. How do you approach it? Formally, mm -hmm. I mean that's that's my art training, mm -hmm. right? Um, again, when I was studying in school, who did I see in the galleries? Solowit, Donald Judd. So I describe these works for those of us um, who might not. Immediately conjure up a Saul Lewitt in our mind. <laughs> uh, they're, they're, it's all about geometry. It's all about spatial uh, presence based on geometric form and uh, measuring. And Yeah. Um, Black canvases, very thin lines, some of you may kind of recognize. Cubes, yeah, cubes, a lot of cubes, a lot of... Yeah, yeah. Grids. Uh, grids. Grids, many, many grids. Graph paper, um, think graph paper in so very all large of this, size. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> all of this is in my DNA, because mm -hmm. this is what I was seeing when I was starting to make work. And, uh, and you know, I wonder whether advertising had something to do with it, because I learned uh, typography in advertising. I learned graphic design from advertising. And so I have that training. Um, and maybe it influences my eye as well, but there's a, there's a distinct order that comes to the fore uh, when I'm hanging my work or for the book, or even when I'm applying for a grant application and there's, you know, seven images, there's very, a very specific way I choose the first image and the seventh image. How are we on time, Alexander? Five more minutes? Okay. <laughs> You begrudgingly used a digital camera for one of the series <laughs> in this show. <laughs> Can you yes. tell us about that? Uh, Identify the series and what <laughs> happened. Um, so when I was finishing the Listen series, you know, you spend close to 20 years on something, you, uh, you know, you get writer's block. You're afraid, what am I going to do next? Uh-oh, you know, how am I going to top this? Mm -hmm. What's the next series? And I knew that it was, had, it was going to be something about dance or the audience, because it seemed like the, those were the next steps. Um, and a friend cleaned out his storage space and offered me a bag of ballet shoes that he had found in the garbage 12 years earlier, thrown in his storage space and forgot about. And here I am with 151 point shoes. Um, not knowing what to do with them. And the more I considered them, uh, the more I learned about ballet. Again, the research. I, you know, I, here are the shoes. I'm going to go see what, what is ballet, who invented it, who was the first ballerina, where was it performed, what's it made out of, what does it take to make the shoe. Um, and the more I stared at these shoes, the more I realized and, and researched how difficult it is, how much strength, how much dedication, how much knowledge, how much effort it takes to be, how much commitment to be a ballerina and dance weightlessly across the stage. And here I am with these beautiful little pink silk shoes that are very hard. Uh, and I couldn't put one of those on my feet if my life depended on it. Um, and I, I realized that everything that it takes to be a ballerina is in the point of the shoe. Uh, 
the, the center of gravity for her is that point in the, her toe, in the point shoe. And looking at the point of all these shoes, each one was distinctly different. And they became clearly portraits of the ballerina that had danced in them. Uh, so I thought, all right, we're going to do these still lives, these points. Um, but in order to achieve what I wanted to achieve, which was that the, the entire depth of the part of the shoe that I was showing would be 100% in focus, what kind of equipment do I use for that? And we went from regular digital, you know, not digital, I'm sorry, regular 35 millimeter cameras to 4x5s to 8x10s to a 4x5 bellows on a I mean, we just, we constructed these crazy cameras out of many parts and couldn't get it right. And we tried just a digital camera with a different back or whatever, didn't work. And the only way to achieve it was uh, more digital than digital, uh, which was a digital camera attached to a computer uh, that photographed 70 or 65 or 70 um, points, focal points, but you know, millimeters apart and then layer them all together. So I went from pure analog to total digital because it's not about the equipment. And I, this is something I had to learn. It's about a photograph about what it is I'm trying to make and if the tool that I need to make it is only this tool and this is the tool I'm going to use so and do you, should we open it up to questions at this point yeah Alexander has the mic hello yes hello. this is a microphone we want you to use it <laughs> so if you have a question please raise your hand Look at this. This is not a plant, and the microphone will come to you. <laughs> Hi. I had a question about a quote that you said, um, a voice comes to one in the dark, imagine. I was just wondering, was this inspired by the dark rooms that you have to work in, like to develop film and stuff like that? Or is there something else, like another reason why you chose to like use that quote? It, it was inspired by the camera, which is a dark space, right? And an image appears. Uh, not a voice, but an image, but an image and a voice to me are interchangeable almost. But it's a, it's, a, it's a lovely idea to think about the dark room. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it because I hadn't thought about being in the dark room in such a long time. <laughs> so, possible. Um, my question is going to focus on like the first six picture that we walked in the exhibition. So it's about your toys. Um, I wondered, like, you, I feel like you documented them in a way that it's like a realist to me, because you document them from six different angles, so from back, up and down, left to right. It reminded me like when we do some documentary, like docu documentary to some specific like relics, really historical, really important, precious antique, then we did that. And why would you do that to your toy? That makes me like really curious. Uh, that toy in Headshot, which is the name of the series of the work, uh, is that's the toy that my father brought to the hospital the day I was born. And rather than a doll or an animal, it's the head of a clown. So. <laughs> You know, it was written in stone the minute I came out of the womb. Um, and I loved that toy. And it was a, a music box. There's a, a little gear at the bottom. It sat on a little wooden base, and it went around and around. So my experience of it was three-dimensional movement. Um, and I, imaging it from those different angles, mimics the experience that I had of it as it swiveled around on its base. Um, so, hi. So when you take a look at 
in particular the listen series how do you feel that sort of space or geometric form as you discussed with other artists informs the way that you take those photographs so our esteemed museum director and my <coughs> my friend and supporter for all this tracy adler calls them runways and i think that the geometry and the, the sort of that absorption of the idea of angle um, allowed me to construct much of my work with this long foreground which is also an invitation by by having that spatial cue in the work it's like come in come take a look whereas if i was sort of right up against it you 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 know you're you'd have your nose up against the glass but you wouldn't be able to go in and so that's i think that's the way i construct them um rona we have a question from the zoom land oh. um that has come in and, and someone was noticing that we have two photos in the exhibition that you produced from this mechanism called an iphone and um, they are inviting you to open up the can of worms in terms of how you feel about using that technology um, either in your own practice or, or how you um, see it uh, situated in our society now well that's a big question so i'm huge, not going to answer huge all question of that. Uh, what i will say is uh, i'll go back to what i said before if i need to make a photograph i'll use the tool that i need to make that photograph uh, i my dear friend craig duffy um, who's no longer with us knew that my idea my next idea was the audience because i had wanted to embed myself with a traveling performance of some kind and he was a tour manager uh, and it was just before the pandemic we were in the same city at the same time and he invited me to see uh, the show that he was touring and he knew about this idea and he didn't tell me that he was going to give me exactly the seat that i wanted in the theater to make this work. So all I had was my iPhone. And I, it was either you don't make the image or you make it with what tool you have in your hand, which was an iPhone. So I did. Um, now I know that I should well, you know, roll around with a little something in my pocket, which I still don't do. But, um, and then the, the larger question, that's, that's a whole nother Zoom call. <laughs> Hello. You talk about this, um, this desire to capture the ephemeral. And um, something I do a lot in my photography is trying to capture these moments that are so fleeting. And so I'm asking for advice on how you capture the, those moments and then are satisfied with the actual picture. So first of all, I don't think I, I try not to capture anything. Um, I've said I mean, I'll slip sometimes because it's in the lexicon, but the, the language of photography disturbs me. Capture, take, shoot. I try very hard to correct myself. I use the words make. Um, so, yeah, the ephemeral, I mean, we've, I, I hope most of you not, but we've all lost somebody, right? And we hold photographs of them dear. Uh, moments are similar. We have photographs from experiences in our lives. Um, they're, they're, everything is ephemeral. Everything that becomes an image or a photograph or is something we try to treasure or value. Um, and I don't know. I don't know if it's if it's an approach that is humble um, or appreciative. Is it how you go into the how you approach the subject matter? Is it is it how you print it? Um, is it the intent? Is it the outcome? You know, a lot of what I do is is instinctual. It's really with my gut. 
if I overthink it, it'll become an obstacle. I'll be so busy thinking and trying to come up with the language that I won't be able to make the image. I haven't answered your question, but I don't really know how. That's okay. <laughs> Uh, this question stems from your first series of the circus performers and that way that you captured the spotlight just distinctly. How many tries did it take to get that effect? And as you were trying for it, did you have any unexpected results that were actually worth keeping? Um, I just think of like digital photography, you take a million pictures of a moment and for the one that you want to keep. Like, were there any throwaway, how many throwaway pictures, or were they all like worth keeping in your mind? Uh, not that many throwaway pictures because it was just too expensive. Um, so I was careful. But photographing the circus is like photographing sports. Um, when I was lucky, the circus directors would give me a row of seats. And so when the acrobat would fly through the air, I would be running back and forth. Um, and so, yeah, there were throwaways, there were some missed where, you know, I wasn't fast enough to follow them, but um, I didn't have time to make, and it wasn't digital. So it's click, click, you know, it takes a minute till you get through it. Um, so it's not possible to do, I never, I didn't have a, a, a motor drive <laughs> uh, ever. So, um, no, and I, you know, even till today, it's very considered. I don't, I don't waste film. And now I have, I, you know, now knowing more about the chemistry and what goes into making it, I'm really not going to waste film because it's just bad. Not that there's no, there's no film left. But, you know. Um, so you kind of spoke about how this concept of empty spaces and the camera and theater as black boxes um, came to you pretty early on. What has your experience been like seeing all three of these big series um, as a retrospective now? Do you find that there's sort of like narrative clues that you didn't think about early on? Or do you think it was pretty like you, you kind of knew what you were doing since the 90s? <clears throat> I hope I knew what I was doing. <laughs> I don't, I don't think it's an accident, but I do, well, first of all, it's, it's so emotional and so gratifying to see my work together, uh, thanks to Tracy Adler, who, anyway, um, what I did s discover here are relationships that I didn't think existed. So you mentioned the three series. Tracy insisted that uh, this, the body of work that I made during COVID called Ghost Light be included. And it was the only time that I was like, mm, I, don't, I don't agree with her. It's her museum, but I don't agree with her. And now I understand how much it belongs here. So without it being on the wall, without me seeing them physically, I don't know if it was in a book, I don't think I would have noticed these relationships. So it's all, it's all a learning experience for me, too. I'm, I'm new to this just as you all are. Um, we do have another uh, question from Zoom. I'd like to remind you that I'm just a messenger here, Rona. Uh-oh. Um, and the question is if you have any um, comments or ideas about the relationship between um, ideas versus inspiration in terms of the things that you're maybe thinking about and trying to go out and make versus the things that are more serendipitous that sort of happen upon you or, or you find and lead you into a direction. I think if you have ideas, I think if you have inspiration or ideas, you become open to what might help you travel down that road. I think it's just, it's what I said before, not getting caught up in the language. And, you know, my I don't know, ideas and inspiration are kind of similar to me. I, you know, I might wake up at three in the morning with an idea for a new work or a, a thought or a, sort of an image 
that I conjure up, I am um, talking to you like you're the Zoom person. Uh, it's just, if you're open to ideas and inspiration, then you're open to what might arrive on your doorstep. I was thinking about dance. Point shoes arrive on my doorstep, you know. I'm open to miracles. I'm open to whatever happens, you know. And if one door is closed, maybe another one will open. So I, I think uh, that's kind of it. I don't know really what else to say. We do have time for one more question. Yes? Uh oh, it's the professor. We're going to get in trouble now. <laughs> Am I allowed to ask a question? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm really struck of how you talk about the dimensionalities of your photographs. You've talked about them as objects, and of course, Tracy has framed them as runways. Um, but in particular, when I'm looking at the Listen series, you uh, talked about this as being an experience. And we can't help as a viewer understand how you are also in the place that we are experienced, that interiority, the dimensionality of the photograph. But I was wondering, as you're conceiving this really big series, did you find some kind of repetition or how do you kind of get into the space and how do you know in the limited amount of time they're also trying to structure in the moment of taking that space? Um, how do you know where you wanna be in terms of the positioning of the interior space? I just, it's my job. It's your job. <laughs> but it's our job to analyze <laughs> what you do. It's, it's my, if I don't know how to make a good photograph wherever I am, I'm not doing my job. I should go do something else. Um, you once said to me that when you get into a space, you see the vantage point, and then if you're given too much time, you start doubting yourself, and you go and you start taking pictures from other vantage points. Yeah, because I'm That's, thinking, it's into, because yeah. the language yeah. is coming, and I'm not trusting myself. Yeah. Those are the it obstacles. Intuitive. Yeah. Um, it's more often than not the first or second frame on the roll that is the one that I use. Mm -hmm. So, and yeah, there's repetition. It's an interior space. I mean, even with the circus work, there was repetition. I saw the same act in different colors 10 times. But each one had a little bit of something different. So, um, Rona Bittner Resound is on view until December 9th, <laughs> and the Welland Museum of Art is free, both for its exhibitions and its programs, so please come back often, but for right now, please help me thank Nadia Bear and Rona Bittner. Thank you.